let us come let us adore you kneel down before you kneel down before you in your presence Lord worship worship tonight we pray my father that you would crown our head with this the word of god you yes. pray for our pastor that, who's teaching the lesson tonight and all that's present oh thank you for your mercy your grace and your goodness in jesus name we pray amen amen amen, amen. good evening everyone good evening we are back at it <laughs> Another session, another time we can come together and we can uh, come together as a family and we can enjoy the word of God together. There is nothing like being able to uh, rejoice and to grow and to, and to learn more about who God is and what God wants and how God wants it and how we can continue to be better in the Lord. And uh, it's always great to know that we do have that opportunity uh, to grow and to be better, be better. We are starting a new, a new Bible study on tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Um, it is a Bible study that is that's most is is overlooked a lot uh, by um, many uh, Christian believers. Uh, it is a book that maybe dabbled into here and there just to get a a good old quote in, <laughs> but as far as really diving into uh, the meaning. Uh, diving into the word, diving into uh, how this book affects our life. It's very rare that you see a Bible study on it, but um, it's great beyond the God that he has allowed us to be able to do so mm -hmm. and allowed us to do so in a manner that we can come together mm -hmm. and we can just be able to worship the Lord through learning. Amen. Through our learning. We've discussed in previous Bible studies uh, how we are to grow in God, how we are draw, be drawn closer to God, how it is that we ought to use our lives to uh, fulfill the purpose that God has uh, in our lives. Uh, we have studied uh, how we ought to operate as far as believers, as far as being disciples for Christ, allowing God to take full control of our lives so that his domain, his authority, his power can take over who we are and how we live in our lives. So we take everything that we've learned, uh, how to grow, how to use the power of God for our lives, how to become disciples. And now we take the turn into trying to figure out, trying to understand how. Mm -hmm. How do we live? How do we be disciples? How do we use our lives in such a manner where God gets the glory, get, God gets all the praise uh, in our lives. And so Proverbs really allows for us to get that understanding of how it is we ought to live. 
Uh, so the first question um, that we would ask is, what is the book of Proverbs? Well, uh, the book of Proverbs is it's a collection of practical life wisdom uh, that's been given mostly in short, memorable statements uh, through part of a larger body of wisdom liter literature in the Bible that includes the book of Job, it includes Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. It's the book of uh, Proverbs that is the most unique out of those books. Uh, it is unique because of its structure. Uh, the first, uh, the first, I believe the first nine chapters of Proverbs is written in a poetic manner. Um, it's unique because it's being mo it's mostly a collection of individual statements without much context or without in much organization by a certain topic. Uh, so when you read Proverbs, it just feels like it's just scattered. It's just coming out of nowhere. Mm. Um, it is unique in its theology. Uh, it is concerned with practical life wisdom more than it's concerned about the ideas about God and his work of salvation. Uh, you know, 95% of the Bible is about God and what God does and the work of his salvation. But Proverbs does not touch on that. Proverbs is touches on practical life wisdom. Proverbs is also unique uh, in its connection with the sec secular world, uh, its connection with secular literature of its times. Uh, neighboring kingdoms had their own collection of wisdom literature. And, and in some places, uh, there are significant similarities between secular wisdom and the Proverbs. Uh, but Proverbs makes it very clear. It makes it very clear that a proverb is not a magical formula, is not bringing wisdom and blessing by incantation. Uh, matter of fact, right in the book of Proverbs, it tells us in uh, chapter 26, verse 7, like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Uh, so it, it tells us that there's nothing magical about a proverb. There's nothing miraculous about a proverb. Uh, a proverb is just what it is. It is a collection of wisdom. Uh, so who wrote the proverbs? Um, it is, it is known that Solomon was uh, a famous king of Israel, and he was mostly famous for his wisdom. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, the Bible tells us that Solomon asked God for wisdom mm -hmm. in order for him to lead God's people. And the Bible tells us that God answered his prayer and gave him wisdom. Therefore, Solomon became extremely famous for and extremely rich uh, because of this wisdom. Uh, in the first Kings, it presents a remarkable demonstration of Solomon's wisdom uh, seen in his response to the problem that he that was presented to him of the two women uh, who had uh, who had the the son. They were fighting over the son and and, and the scripture uh, walks us through how uh, King Solomon solved that issue through basic wisdom. Uh, there is also this description of Solomon's wisdom uh, in 1 Kings chapter 4, when it tells us that he spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005 in number. 
tells us that he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. He spoke of a man of all nations from all the kings of the earth. Uh, had they came from miles and miles away just to hear of his wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, when we start off in the book of uh, Proverbs, we're going to we're going to begin. Let me see somebody's trying to come in. I don't see them. Uh, where where are they? I don't see them. Okay. Uh, we are going to begin again, or we're going to begin reading on tonight in the book of Proverbs in chapter one, and we're going to study verses one through seven, which is known as the introduction to the Proverbs. Uh, so someone, if you will, can you take your Bibles and Turn to the book of Proverbs and read uh, chapter one, verses one through seven. <laughs> Reading from the new NIV. It says the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words and insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Amen. 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 So according to Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, uh, it gives us reasons why the Lord, why God has given us or blessed us with this uh, book of Proverbs. Uh, the opening, which the very first phrase, the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, this phrase should not be taken to mean that Solomon was the author of all of these Proverbs. Uh, there are a few other authors that were specifically mentioned in the book of Proverbs. Yet it may well be that uh, Solomon, he collected all of these other Proverbs and he set them in this book. So whether Solomon was the collector or it was some unnamed person, we can't know for certain. But we know that in the beginning of his collection of Proverbs, uh, Solomon explained the purpose of all of these uh, Proverbs. He explains to us the reasoning why um, he collected these, these, these collections of wisdom for us. He tells us in verses one and two, uh, they are intended to give the attentive reader wisdom, mm -hmm. to give the attentive reader instruction, mm -hmm. perception, and understanding. He says the main intention for all this, these Proverbs is to give the attentive reader wisdom, instruction, perception, and understanding. And yes, we are living in an age of information. Uh, no matter, you know, no matter what we want to learn, no matter what we want to know, no matter what we want to find out, no matter if we just, we just want to be nosy, we want to be gossipy, whatever the case may be. We're living in an age now where all information is available to us right at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. We could just open up our computers or open up our phones, 
go to Google and we can type in anything that we want to <laughs> find out. And it within seconds, it pops up for us. So we have all of this information that's available to us. But unfortunately, uh, we're living in an age now where uh, it's definitely not an age of wisdom. Uh, we are we are living in times where wisdom is on the back burner. You know, we can see it by how this world is at the moment, the things that are happening, the way our children are living their lives and the things that they choose to get involved with. It is, it is just known that wisdom is not on the forefront this day and age. But as Christians, as believers, we are to perceive or we are to read or we are to seek after understanding. We're about to leave and that. that understanding only comes through the word of God. Mm -hmm. Only comes through the word of God. It is it is helpful for us to remember the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Okay. You know, we we can have all the knowledge in the world, but don't have wisdom. Mm -hmm. We can know every single book that's ever been ever been written, but at the same time, not be wise. Mm -hmm. One may have knowledge but not have wisdom, okay? okay. Um, knowledge, if we were to give it a, a, a definition, knowledge is the collection of facts. That's all knowledge is, knowing a whole lot of facts. But wisdom is the right use of what we know for daily living. Wisdom is, is knowing what you know, but knowing how to use what you know to get the best benefits out of your life. Knowledge can tell one how financial systems work. We can know about you know, stocks and bonds. We can know about banking. We can know about crediting. We can know about everything there is to know about the financial system. But wisdom is what we use to manage a budget properly. Okay. Okay. So there's a huge difference between knowledge and wisdom. Therefore, knowledge is the accumulation and mastery of facts. But wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge to life so as to lead a godly life. It is the ability to know how to live in a way that is pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. Not just who God is, not just how God works, not just the fact that we can quote scripture, but we ought to live our lives in such a way that we know how to maneuver through life, how to deal with certain situations, different circumstances, how to deal with certain failures, certain disappointments, know how to deal with these things so we can be pleasing in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. And one of the purposes of the book of Proverbs is to enable us to know wisdom and understanding, or in other words, how to discipline ourselves, mm -hmm. how to be kingdom disciples uh, for Christ. And we acquire wisdom as we submit to the instructions of God's word and how we allow it to directly discipline our lives. Mm -hmm. So then in verse number three, uh, it tells us that these are given to us, these proverbs, these wisdoms are given to us 
so that the reader may receive instruction in wise behavior, namely in righteousness, in justice, and in equity. The Lord ha also has given us the book of Proverbs in order that we might receive instruction in wise behavior. So wise behavior, that phrase, wise behavior, comes from the Hebrew word that has a root me meaning of to entwine or to involve yourself in. Mm -hmm. Thus, one of the reasons our Heavenly Father has given us the book of Proverbs is to help train us or to instruct us on how to work our way through complicated spiritual issues and moral problems. And we all can uh, testify to the fact that this world is filled and this life is filled with spiritual issues and moral problems. Mm -hmm. So God has given us this book of Proverbs to help train us, mm -hmm. to help guide us, to help instruct us how to maneuver our way, our, our, our way through these issues and problems. And the object of this instruction or this discipline is that we may gain an acquaintance with Righteousness, justice, and equity. Another word for equity, fairness. So in other words, it is good for us to know the book of Proverbs and to be accustomed to the book of Proverbs and to live by the wisdoms of the book of Proverbs so that we may become like the Lord himself. For we know that Jehovah is righteous, yes. and so therefore he loves righteousness. And so therefore he's not going to let us hang out by ourselves. He's not going to just dangle us over the cliff. He's just not going to just leave us out in the dark because he loves us. He gives us the instructions. He gives us the training book. He gives us the guidance on how to live in righteousness so that we can become more and more and more like him. So then how can we become increasingly proficient in this wise behavior, in this quest or this 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 search or this thrive to live a righteous life for God. All right. Well, it tells us it tells us to answer this question in the book of Psalms, Psalms one nineteen. So I would love for someone, if you will, to turn to Psalm one nineteen and read verses ninety nine and a hundred for us. Psalms 119, verses 99 and 100. Okay, Psalms 119, verses 99. Uh, reading from the King James Version. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditations. I understand more than the uh, anxious because I keep thy precepts. Amen. So, by meditating on God's word, by reading and understanding God's word, by throwing ourselves into God's word, we become increasingly proficient in righteous thinking, and we become increasingly proficient in righteous living. 
Okay. And we put into practice what we are taught by God's word. So this scripture also tells us that wisdom has nothing to do with age. My Lord. The ability to live for God the right way and in righteousness has nothing to do with age, but it has everything to do with our willingness and our thrive to not only read and meditate on the word of God, right. but also live out the word of God. It's always said that the best sermon that you could ever preach is not what comes out of your mouth but it comes by how you live your life. And how can you live your life the right way without being taught or instructed? Mm -hmm. And where do we get our instructions and our teaching from? Bible. The word of God. The word of God, that's right. Yeah. So God has given us all that we need in order to live a righteous life and to be a great disciple for him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, someone, if you will, can you reread uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 4 for us, please? One four says, to give, mm -hmm. Probably because you and you and Erica are close by, yeah. You guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, nah, I can't see it. If thou seeketh her as silver and searchest for her as for high for hidden treasure, then shall thou understand the fear of the Lord. Is that the most? No, uh, Proverbs 1, verse That's 4. Right. My son, if thou wilt. Where you going? One nope. verse four. Chapter one, verse four. Chapter one, verse four. Give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So he says. The proverb book of Proverbs has been given with the intention that the naive may, in other words, receive prudence. Mm -hmm. okay. So, how does uh, what's the definition of naive, or how does the Bible <laughs> define naive? The lack of wisdom. Uh, lack of wisdom. Yes. It, it describes it pretty well in Proverbs 14 and 15. It, it says, the naive believes every word, but a prudent man carefully considers his steps. So in other words, the naive or the simple-minded are those who are gullible and those who have no discernment. Okay. The naive person lacks the ability uh, to critically evaluate ideas and suggestions. A naive person just accepts anything and everything, accepts anybody presented to them. A naive person will just act it would just act out without considering the consequences, without considering the moral significance of their decisions. 
for example, if someone was to if someone suggests to the naive person, let's do drugs, that naive person will thoughtlessly consent to that request. Okay. That's what drug, drug dealers, that's what they look out for. They look for naive, simple-minded people. But the wisdom of this book of Proverbs will make the young, will make the naive, will make the inexperienced person know what to do and know how to do it in life. The purpose of the book of Proverbs is so that it will give the young person knowledge and discretion. It also mentions prudence. Prudence is the ability to exhibit and uh, an examining and evaluating and a uh, um, a discriminating mind, knowing the different, being able to compartmentalize things able to analyze what's in their mind. The prudent person asks questions like, what are we about to do? <clears throat> what is being taught to me? Is this behavior good or bad? Is the teaching that I'm getting, is it true or false? Is what this person that's standing on this podium preaching to me, is it biblical or is it not? A prudent person is going to think before they act. They're going to critically evaluate ideas and suggestions in light of God's word. And so as we study the, the book of Proverbs, we're going to be taught by God how to act sensibly, how to act uh, with some discernment. We are going to be taught by God how to act with an examining and evaluating mind as opposed to acting thoughtlessly or naively. Amen. That's a, that's, that's a another purpose of this entire book of Proverbs. Also, it tells us in this uh, uh, fourth verse of Proverbs uh, that it offers something to uh, the young man or the young person. Uh, two characteristics of youth or young, young person are, are these two things inexperience and impulsiveness. Okay. All of us who've had children or who have children, we know these things too well. That they will get into trouble because of these two things, inexperience and impulsiveness. So what is needed is first knowledge, which is the accumulation of facts, which are the building blocks of education. And second thing that's needed is discretion, which is the ability to use the knowledge as the basis for making wise decisions and planning a godly course of action in life. But still another reason why the Lord has given us the book of Proverbs is so that the youth, as well as all those who may be an experience in moral and spiritual living, may learn knowledge and discretion. But we must note that the book of Proverbs is not only for the simple-minded, it's not only for the youth, it's not only for the inexperienced. Because even a wise person will find much to help 
and much to guide them if they will only choose to hear what the Lord has to say in the book of Proverbs. Even a person of understanding can attain wise counsel from the book of Proverbs. So that as we prepare to dive into this, the study of the book of Proverbs, uh, we, 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 we have a grasp of why God wrote or allowed these, this book of Proverbs to be part of his holy word. But then the question is, what is the model? What is the point? What is the overarching principle that is presented in the book of Proverbs? And the whole motto, the whole principle of the entire book of Proverbs is written for us in the seventh verse of Proverbs chapter one. Someone, can you reread that for me? Proverbs one chapter, I mean, Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fool despise wisdom and instruction. All right, amen. So as we approach this Proverbs of Solomon or the schooling of Solomon, uh, we find this motto prominently ascribed above the entryway of the door as we walk through it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. All right. Fear. It is the fear of the Lord that is the starting point of knowledge. It is the fear of the Lord that will catapult us, catapult us into the desire to want to know how to live this life for God the right way. All right. In other words, the fear of the Lord is the starting point as well as the chief part of true knowledge in this life. Mm -hmm. And so why do we need the guidance of these principles? Why do we need the guidance of uh, these Proverbs or the wisdom that is given to us in this book of Proverbs? Well, according to Proverbs 14 and 27, it says, the fear of Jehovah is a fountain of life, okay. causing a man to turn from the snares of death. <clears throat> so rightly understood, this guiding principle, namely, is to have our lives governed by a holy fear of the Lord, which will then lead us in the way of life and keep us from the way of death. Okay. And it's not just talking about physical death. It's mm -hmm. talking about spiritual death. All right. Whole lot of people are walking around this earth spiritually dead mm. because they refuse to either read the word of God mm -hmm. or they refuse to understand the word of God. And even if they read and understand the word of God, do they're walking around spiritually dead because they refuse to live out mm -hmm. the word of God. So may the Lord cause us to appreciate the fact that this is a, tr this is truly a motto by which we must live. Mm -hmm. We must live our lives by and through the fear of the Lord. Mm -hmm. But why fear? Why should we live in fear? Mm. Why is it that we must 
base our lives upon the fact that we must live in fear. Bible says that we ought not live in fear. That we must trust in God and so forth and so on. So, so obviously there's something that we must understand about this word fear that's used here. Okay. This word fear is not the fear as far as being afraid of, but this word fear is the fear of respect, the fear of bowing down to, the fear of, of showing reverence to the Lord. All right. Because if we show reverence to him, if we show recognition of who he is, then therefore we should, and that's a main word, we should want to do everything we possibly can to live our lives the right way. All right. That is pleasing to him. All right. Someone, if you will, can you turn to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6? And then someone else, if you can, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. And then a third person, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 39. So I would like someone, if you will, you read for us Jeremiah chapter 10. Verses six and seven. <clears throat> okay, Jeremiah ten, six and seven. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O God, O King of nations? For to thee uh, doeth it uh, appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee amen amen it says there's none like you oh god that's right. you are great your name is mighty mm -hmm. who should not fear you that's right for it is due to you so right. our fear of him, our respect, our reverence to him is due to him. That's it. That's it. It is. It is telling us that it is appropriate. It is proper to respond to the person of God with holy, reverential fear, to show him reverence, because the Lord is worthy of such fear, and to him, it rightly, rightfully belongs. Mm -hmm. God is not just the man upstairs. Right. We hear that all the time. Yeah. Given, given, we I think the man upstairs. Yeah. yeah. He's not just a mystical being, as some people refer to him. He is the Holy One of Israel. That's right. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who is exalted above all creation and who is set apart in infinite moral purity. He is above all things. But at the same time, he's the one who has shown us so much grace, so much mercy, and so much love. That's it. He has graciously consented to enter into an intimate covenant relationship with those who receive him as his personal savior. So 
so that it is good for us to show him reverence. It's good for us to show fear towards him. Because in, in Proverbs 16 and 6, it says, by the fear of Jehovah, uh, men turn away from evil. Mm. A holy fear of the Lord is used by him to turn us away from evil. Mm. When we know that we are, we are governed and loved uh, by such a powerful and mighty God. It should turn our minds away from doing the things that are not pleasing to him. So therefore, it is the fear of the Lord that turns us from evil. Someone, if you will, can you turn to, can you read for us Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Hebrews 11, 7. Hebrews eleven seven says, excuse me, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he commanded the, he commanded the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Amen. Amen. So it gives us an example of an individual who lived by fear or by reverence of God. It says by his faith, Noah, when he was warned about the things that he has not seen yet, he moved through faith, through his godly fear or his godly reverence and prepared an ark which saved him and his family, okay? And by his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that came by his faith. So a holy fear of the Lord, a holy reverence of God is used by God to move us and to motivate us to obedience. It is the reverence of God that should compel us to obey his word. If we didn't have the fear or the reverence of God, we would be doing anything and everything you wanted to do. You know, we may think, oh, we fear the law of man. That's why we're not going to do certain things. We may say, oh, we fear that we're going to go to jail. That's why we will do certain things. Or we fear that we will be disliked by others. That's why we will do certain things. But the real reason why we don't do certain things that we don't do is, and it should be because of our reverence to God. And then finally, Someone, if you will, can you read Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 39 through 40? And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they would that they shall not depart from me. Amen. So a holy fear of the Lord is used by God also to bind us to Christ so that we can have a close relationship with him. It's the relationship between, there's a relationship between fearing the Lord and loving the Lord. And that relationship is this. It tells us in 1 Peter 1 and 17, and if you call upon the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, 
Live your remaining time on earth in fear, which tells us that our relationship with God as our loving heavenly father must not be abused. Rather, it must be complemented with a reverential fear, all right. knowing that God, our father, is also the righteous judge of all the earth. Mm. First John 4.18 tells us that there's no fear in love, mm -hmm. but perfect love drives out fear yes. because fear relates to punishment. Tells us the man who fears is not made perfect in love. So when we talk about fear, we talk about love and how it is used to keep us from spiritual death, how it's used to keep us from uh, doing evil, how it's used to, uh, to allow us and to compel us to obey God, how it's used to, for us to have a loving relationship with him. It tells us that when our love for God is perfect, uh -huh. as it will be in the eternal kingdom of heaven, there will no longer be the need for reverential fear mm. as a motivation to obedience. Right. We will no longer need to have that fear of a reverence of God in order to deter us from sin. Perfect love will willingly render perfect wholehearted obedience. All right. All right. So that's what we are striving for. That's what we are working towards. That's what we are building upon. That's when we open up the word of God, when we read the word of God, when we meditate on the word of God, when we try our best to live by the word of God, we are doing so that we can reach that goal of having such a close, loving relationship with God where we don't need to fear him, we'll just be willingly able and willing to just live in obedience. And that takes a whole lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. That takes a whole lot of sacrifice. It takes a whole lot of Stop provoking uh, processes within our mind and within our hearts and within our souls. And that's what the Proverbs helps us to do. It helps us to have those thoughts, those knowledge, that knowledge, that guiding blueprint in our mind, in our hearts, so that we can have a chance to live the way God wants us to live. Pro the book of Proverbs, its introductory passage makes it clear that growth in godly character is not an automatic process. The way of wisdom is, it, it is held out to us. It is, God is, in other words, he's reaching his hand out and giving us the ways of wisdom but we must expose ourselves to his instruction in order to manifest it. We must be willing to open up our minds, open up our hearts and truly dive into it so that we can live the way God wants us to live. Amen. We must do what it tells us in Proverbs 1 verse five, let the wise hear and increase in love. And here we get a glimpse of sanctification, which is the process of being made holy, which is revealed more fully in the New Testament. It is the word of God, it's the spirit of God, and it is the believer all participating together in this transformation process. God gives it, 
we must read it and meditate on it. And we must allow the Holy Spirit to let it become a part of our, the way we live our lives. This is given to us in Romans 12, 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world. Be not. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Tell us Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, it's our responsibility to want to have the knowledge, to want to have the discernment, to want to have the wisdom that God has given to us, to want to take that knowledge and actual, actually live it out so that we can live our lives the way God wants us to live it. Good. And so therefore that is the purpose. That is the reason why we are going to dive into this book of Proverbs so that we can have the knowledge, so that we can allow God to speak to wisdom through us, so that we can do our best to live our lives the way God wants us to live it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Is there any questions or any comments that you may have in regards to the lesson on tonight. Looking forward um, to it. Thank Is you, Pastor. Of comment? Uh, Pastor Hampton, do, do you have an outline of what we're going to study that uh, we may have something to follow? Uh, I am currently working on something. Okay. Uh, it may it may just be I just may give you the scriptures ahead of time so you can read them, or then I may uh, have like questions that we can go over mm -hmm. while we're going through the study. All right, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, one of the thoughts that I had um, from this uh, evening, like going the proverbs, it's just like going through a a big novel or a lesson that you're learning, but you know, instead of just, uh, maybe you don't have time right now to get the whole book, but you can get the synopsis of it. And the, and the uh, Proverbs have a whole lot of synopsis for living. So um, it's really important to go through this and maybe identify, you know, the, um, the different synopsis or the different uh, features of what, uh, I'm trying to find the word you use. Well, it's different pieces of knowledge. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's such, a, it's such a big book, number one. And number two, like I said earlier, it's scattered. <laughs> okay. It's like reading one well, of the worst books I, I, I I disliked reading these books in school. It's those books that have all kinds of short stories in it. Mm -hmm. And then the teacher has the audacity to want to <laughs> give you a test on what the book's about. But there's 20 different stories in the book. Mm -hmm. That's what the Book of Proverbs is like. But we're going to attempt to dissect the Book of Proverbs so we can understand exactly what it's trying to tell us. So for the pastor, for uh, next week's lesson, will you concentrate mainly on chapter two or you're going to just finish chapter one? No, next week's lesson is going to be Proverbs chapter one, verses eight through 19. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, we're going to go through, we're going to go through the book that way. Uh, we'll try not to skip anything. 
And we're gonna go through the whole book in that in that form or fashion. So next week will be verses eight through nineteen of chapter one. Chapter one, verse eighteen. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. If there is anything else, we will go ahead and we're going to ask uh, uh, Reverend Polk if he will pray us out on tonight. You know, we have a few members of our congregation who are sick under the weather, going through some certain things. So it is always good for us to pray together. Mm. And also, you know, this world is. It's going crazy, so there's a whole lot of things that we need to go to the Lord in prayer for. Amen. So, Amen. Reverend Pope. Father God, Lord, thank you for giving us another opportunity, Father God, to petition your throne of grace. Lord, we pray that the words that were shared here tonight, the message and the beginning into this study in Proverbs, Father God, would marinate in our hearts, Father God, and we would be more prepared to receive your word and walk it out, as the pastor said, not about hearing the word, but doing the word, Lord. We thank you, Father, for giving us this, giving our pastor the desire to bring this message to us. We ask you, Father God, that you just help us to extract all of the, the vitamin A, Bs, and Cs up out of this thing so we can give you glory, honor, and praise. Mm -hmm. Lord, we also want to pray for our members, Lord, that are down, such as Virginia and Rashid, Father God, they have that COVID, Lord, we lift them up in Jesus' name. Just ask you that you keep them safe, Father God, and those who were able to participate in our Bible study and those who didn't, Father, we lift them up and just ask that your will be done, Lord, and we just thank you, Father. We thank, thank you because we understand, Lord, this is We've been given a gift to serve you because out of all of the billions of people that are on this planet, not everybody recognizes Jesus yeah. as their personal Lord and Savior. So we just thank you for this call on Lord and just ask that you would help us to recognize the strength that you have placed within us to walk this thing out, that you might get all the glory, honor, and praise. It is in the mighty and matchless name of our love and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. 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 Once again, thank all of you for joining us on tonight. God bless you, and we'll see you until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Good night. Bless you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. There's a um, there's a meeting going on uh, for uh, I guess citizens of San Francisco. Uh, they had a like a a planning meeting I guess last night. And it's going to be uh, presented to the Board of Supervisors 